Welcome. This is Professor Richard Holizak, and this is the Database System Architectures Lecture. To start, let's review with the different components of a database system. First, we have the database. This is the collection of logically related data that is stored in database files. We can simply think of this as the data. Next, we have the Database Management System, or DBMS. This is the software that manages the data. The DBMS has functions, including the ability to store and retrieve data in database files, running SQL queries, processing transactions, and carrying out concurrency control. The DBMS is also responsible for backup and recovery, as well as securing the data. Then we have applications, which are typically divided into two pieces. First, we have the user interface. This is the set of text boxes and buttons and combo boxes and so on that the user will click on and type into in order to work with the application. We then have the business logic, and this is the code that implements the rules of the business. This is sometimes also called application logic or business rules. An example of business logic might be a banking application that will determine whether or not a customer should get a loan. This application would take in data about the customer's monthly income, how much they're looking to borrow, what their current debt might be, and what their credit score is. And then the business logic will determine whether or not to extend the loan. Every organization that has an application will have hundreds, if not thousands, of lines of business logic code that is written into the application to carry out those business functions. Here's an example of an application. Many students work with the learning management system called Blackboard. Blackboard typically has two user interfaces. There is a web browser user interface where students can log in, and there is also an app that will run on a smartphone. Both of those user interfaces communicate with a web server. That web server contains all of the business logic. Some examples of the business logic for Blackboard include which courses to show to a student whether or not a student can upload a homework assignment to their class, uh, whether or not a student can view notes or download a particular presentation from Blackboard. And finally, that web server communicates with the database server, and that database server contains the database management system software, as well as the actual data stored in the database. So in this way, the same business logic DBMS and database can serve multiple user interfaces. And this is a typical example of an application. So to review, a database system architecture combines the database, the DBMS, the user interface, and the business logic. When we put those four elements together, we can find that there are basically five architectures. The mainframe architecture, standalone PC, file sharing, two-tier client server, and three-tier client server architecture. Over the next few slides, we'll introduce each of these architectures and talk a little bit about their features, their pros, and their cons. First up is the mainframe architecture, and this is arguably the first mass data processing architecture in existence. Mainframes have been around since the 1960s, and they continue to be used today. The features of the mainframe include all of the components, the user interface, business logic, DBMS, and database, all running within the mainframe's hardware. Even the user interface is processed and drawn by the mainframe and displayed on a terminal. A terminal is simply a display and keyboard connected directly to the mainframe through their communications channels. The advantage of this approach is that the mainframe is highly scalable. A mainframe can support thousands of concurrent users, and the mainframe is designed to process transactions at an extremely high rate. Mainframes are also quite resilient and fault tolerant. Components can be replaced, and the system can be expanded without needing to shut down or reboot. All of these features make the mainframe very attractive 
for large scale applications in air traffic control, ticketing, financial services, and government agencies. The biggest disadvantage of the mainframe architecture is the user interface is quite inflexible. As I mentioned, the mainframe determines what the user will see and what the user will interact with on their terminal. There is no easy way for a user to change how data is displayed or to manipulate the data outside of what the application explicitly allows. It's also quite expensive to purchase a mainframe and to expand it. Now let's talk about a completely different architecture. And this is the standalone PC architecture. At first glance, things look a little bit similar to how the mainframe operates, but there's a bunch of huge differences. In the personal computer or workstation, the user interface, business logic, DBMS, and database all run on that personal computer. This gives the user complete control over the data. If you'd like to sort your data a different way or turn it into a pie chart, all of that can be done because again, the user has complete control over their data. Of course, the biggest disadvantage of a standalone computer is that it's impossible to share the data, or at least it's very, very difficult. So there's only one user that will be able to use this system at a time. In addition, there's limited ability to process transactions, and in general, personal computers are not very robust or secure. Certainly not anywhere near as robust or secure as a mainframe. In some sense, you could almost think of the personal computer as the complete opposite of the mainframe. Users have total control over their data, but just about all of the other features are lacking. Let's look at a couple of examples of the standalone PC architecture. Many students are familiar with Microsoft Access, and if we look at the different parts to the application, the user interface and business logic are coded in forms and reports that are built into Microsoft Access. The database management system is also built into Microsoft Access. And the database files are actual files that sit in the operating system in the file system. So these four components, the user interface, business logic, DBMS, and database are all running on the same computer. Another way to look at it is within the same database file, the forms and reports are able to communicate with the tables and the data that are sitting inside of the same file. So it's truly a standalone, self-contained database system. One of the big disadvantages of the standalone PC architecture is the inability to share data. And so in looking at this diagram, how can we come up with an architecture that will allow us to keep our nice graphical user interface, but at the same time, share the data? And this, of course, is what the file sharing architecture does for us. Now we have a situation where we have separate computers. We have a file server whose sole job is to support the database. So the database files are located on a file server. And then we have one or more clients, which again are personal computers, that contain the user interface, business logic, and database management system. Notice that each client has these elements, or at least a copy of them, the user interface, business logic, and DBMS. These clients communicate over a network and share the database. So the database file sitting on the file server is opened by both clients, and this can be expanded to maybe three or four or possibly five simultaneous clients. The big advantage of this is that we get to retain the graphical user interface and the ability to manipulate data, and we can now share the data. The disadvantage to this architecture is that transaction processing is a little slow. And that is due to the fact that these copies of the database management system 
cannot communicate directly. The only way they can communicate is by setting flags in the database file itself. And so this is a very cumbersome way of performing concurrency control. And as a result, this architecture really doesn't scale up above four or five users. When we talk about the word scalable, we're talking about how many users can simultaneously use the system here. An example of this architecture can be seen in the following. Microsoft Access has a function that will allow you to split a file. When you split the file into two, you end up with one file that contains the data, so the tables, the columns, the constraints, and the records, and another file that contains the application, the user interface, and the business logic. And now these two database files can communicate with one another, over a local area network. This is probably the easiest way to share data scaling up from a standalone PC to the file sharing architecture. As I just mentioned, one of the big disadvantages to the file sharing architecture is really the inefficiency in the way that this data will be shared. It would really be ideal if we just had one copy of the database management system that could handle processing our transactions. And indeed, that architecture is called the two-tier client-server architecture. Here, tier means two levels. In this architecture, we have a database server that is running a copy of the DBMS and also has our data stored in the database. Examples of this might be Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, IBM's DB2, or perhaps even PostgreSQL. Here we have the database management system and the database running on a database server. What does that leave in the clients? Now we just have the user interface and the business logic in each of the clients. And again, they communicate with the database server over a local area network. The advantage of this architecture is that we continue to enjoy the graphical user interface the ability to manipulate data, and this architecture will scale to hundreds of users. We can have hundreds of clients connecting to the same database server. The disadvantage to this approach is that it's more complex to program and maintain. We also run into what's called the thick client problem, where copies of this business logic have to be made on every single client. If we need to make a change to the business logic, we have to visit every single client to make that change. And this can lead to some incompatibility if, for example, we're unable to update a client for some reason. A further example of the client-server architecture is when we take our database file and we upload that data into Microsoft SQL Server. So now Microsoft SQL Server contains our database tables and this is now in the database server, where the client still maintains the application side, the forms and reports, the user interface, and the business logic, all stored in this file. Microsoft actually provides a tool to allow you to upsize your Microsoft Access database to either the file sharing architecture or the two-tier client-server architecture that you see in this diagram. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more detail about how the client-server interaction is carried out. The database server will include a special piece of software called the database listener. The database listener is specific to the vendor of the DBMS that you purchase. So for example, if you have Microsoft SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server will come with a database listener. That listener is paired up with a database driver that runs on the client. The database driver and the database listener communicate with one another. When the client needs to send a query over to the server, it hands that query over to the database driver. The database driver opens up a connection to the database listener, hands over the SQL request, then the database listener runs the query against the database. When the results come back, the database listener packages up those results, 
sends them back over the network to the database driver, which then unpacks those results and hands them back up through the business logic and eventually to the user interface. This back and forth connection is carried out every time the client wants to communicate with the database server. The vendors of the database management systems will actually give you the database drivers and the database listeners that work with their particular type of database. So Oracle has a database driver and a database listener. Microsoft SQL Server has their own database driver and a database listener, and so on. Some examples of this include the MySQL Workbench, which is a client tool with the built-in database driver, and that can talk to the MySQL DBMS. The SQL Server Development Studio can talk to the Microsoft SQL Server DBMS. PG Admin Client can talk to the PostgreSQL DBMS. And the SQL Developer Client can talk to Oracle DBMS. These are just a few examples of software that you could run on a client and have them talk to a database server using this interaction of the database driver talking to the database listener. Another issue that we mention is the problem of the thick client. If we have all of our business logic stored in the client, we can sometimes run into issues when we have to upgrade that business logic. So for example, if one of our business rules needs to change, we need to visit every single client and make sure that that change is put into place. The advantage of this approach, of course, is that we kind of have a division of duties. The client is responsible just for user interface and business logic. The database server is just responsible for the DBMS and the database. An alternative to the thick client is the thin client architecture. And here, the business logic is stored inside the database server itself. So notice we now leave the client with nothing but the user interface. Obviously, the user has to interact with something, so the user interface is, is put there. But on the database server, we can implement all of the business logic inside the database server itself. The two main ways of doing this are with what are called stored procedures or triggers. And the two most popular programming languages for business logic in the database are Oracle's PL SQL and Microsoft's SQL Server Transact SQL or sometimes abbreviated T-SQL. These are full-fledged programming languages with looping and conditionals and all the things that you would find in a, in a normal programming language. The difference is they run inside of the database server. So while this addresses the thick client problem, it may also introduce a different problem. And that is that database servers are really not designed to process business logic. They're really designed to process transactions. So if we don't like the business logic in the client, because that becomes a maintenance issue, and we don't really want to load up our database server with business logic because that's not really what it's good at, what is another solution? The solution is the three-tier client server architecture. In this architecture, we now spread the components of the database system across three types of systems. The client still maintains the user interface. Of course, it has to. The user has to interact with something. The database server maintains the database management system and the database. These two perform the best when they are together on the same system. And then we introduce in the middle what we're going to call an application server. The application server will hold the business logic. So now we have all of our business logic code centralized on one server. If we need to change that logic, we only need to change it in one place. The interaction will work when a user types something into the user interface and submits that data. The client will talk to the application server and hand over that data the user has just submitted. The business logic will go into action and it will process that data do whatever manipulation it needs to do with that data. Once it's finished, it will then form a transaction to send over to the database server. Once the database server carries out that transaction, it will hand back the results to the application server. The application server can continue processing it with business logic, and then finally display the results to the user interface running on the client. 
this little sort of three-step dance happens over and over again in the three-tier client-server architecture. Some advantages of the three-tier architecture are that, again, the user gets to enjoy a graphical user interface. They have the ability to manipulate data. We've also centralized the business logic in the application server, and this architecture is scalable to thousands of users. The biggest disadvantage of this architecture is that it's much more complex to program and troubleshoot. In fact, you could argue that it is the most complex in terms of software development and uh, debugging and so on. The three-tier architecture also lends itself when we consider web applications. Here again, the client is a web browser or an app that might be running on your smartphone. That web browser or app is programmed in HTML, cascading style sheets, JavaScript, maybe includes images and video. And there are many development tools that folks could use to develop these applications, including React, Angular, JS, and jQuery. The database server, or what we call the back end, could be a relational database like Oracle, SQL Server, PostgreSQL, and so on. But it could also be a NoSQL database like Redis, DynamoDB, Cassandra, or MongoDB. The server in the middle, what we call the application server, is actually a web server. And this could be running Microsoft Internet Information Server, Apache, or perhaps a, a Java servlet engine like Tomcat, or an application server like Node.js. There are many different programming languages like PHP and Active Server Pages, and actually JavaScript, that could be used to write the business logic on that web server. In this architecture, the interaction begins when the user works on their web browser or their app, they make a gesture, they type something in, they, they click on a button, and that generates an HTTP request that goes to the web server. The web server receives that request, and then the programming language goes into effect to implement any of the business logic that's necessary. The result of that is a database query that gets sent to the database server. Database server carries out that query and returns the response. That response is further embellished with more programming code, and then finally an HTML response, or maybe perhaps even a JSON file response, is sent back to the web browser or the app. And this architecture, again, is pretty much the, the mainstay of any modern systems architecture that you would see today. Obviously, there are many more details that go into programming such an architecture that are beyond the scope of this video, but we might get to those in other videos. As a summary, the database system architecture consists of the database, the DBMS, the business logic, and the user interface. And as you've seen, each architecture presents some trade-offs in terms of the features, the scalability, the complexity, and the cost. Thanks for watching. Additional notes on database and data warehousing can be found at holozac.com, and I'll see you in the next video.